Thank you, Ron. And good morning to all of you. This morning, I plan to share selected personal reflections that will help all of you to better understand some of the history of this department. I apologize in advance if there are individuals that I have failed to recognize and events that I have not captured or have captured incorrectly in my presentation. You have to appreciate that there was a lot going on and I am limited as to how much I can uh, get into in the time allocated. I have also decided to focus on the first eight to ten years of departmental history. Most of you don't really know how this department began and how we have grown to be a leading department of otolaryngology nationally and internationally in such a short period of time. Please remember that we're only 32 years old. When you surround yourself with ambitious, bright, hardworking, visionary people, it's amazing what can happen. And I think that a little bit of luck added to the recipe I just referenced helped us to get out of the starting blocks full speed ahead. The time has literally flown by. Those 32 years seem like yesterday. Looking at it from my perspective, when everything is coming to a remarkable end, where do you start? Most of you would state, of course you start at the beginning. But I think in this case, my chronicle has to predate the beginning. Perhaps the story goes back to 1975, when I was interviewing for a residency program. I wanted to go to Northwestern and told that to the chairman, Dr. George Sisson, during my interview. Feeling that the interview was going very well, I also shared with him that I wanted to be a chairman like him. You can just imagine his reaction to that. But please remember, nothing happens by accident. I worked hard, spent a year in the lab, published aggressively, and started a hands-on laser surgery workshop two months following the completion of my Head and Neck Fellowship in August 1981. Laryngology didn't even exist back then. But please remember, nothing happens by accident. The workshop was extremely well received, and as a result, we doubled the number of courses from four to eight that first year. The course participants were often very intimidating and included otolaryngology chairs and giants, such as Gene Myers from Pittsburgh and Don Shumrick from Cincinnati. I was quite nervous seeing their names on the registration list, but Dr. Sisson reminded me that I shouldn't worry as I knew more about the subject than they did, and furthermore, both of their institutions had experienced devastating laser-related airway fires. The responsibility associated with being course director of this laser workshop gave me a great academic opportunity to lecture and publish about the subtle nuances of endoscopic laser surgery as well as other topics in the care of the larynx and airway locally, regionally, nationally, and overseas and I took advantage of almost every invitation. Let's jump forward five years to the summer fall of 1985. Vanderbilt was interviewing for the long vacated chair of otolaryngology and I was advised by a good friend who had turned down the offer for personal reasons that I should expect to call from the search committee and with that brief introduction let the story begin. During the summer of 1985, I received a telephone call from an individual with a very genteel southern accent named Jim Netterville. He told me that he was doing his fellowship in head and neck surgery with Mike Maves at the University of Iowa and had done his residency in otolaryngology at the University of Tennessee in Memphis. The reason for his call was that he had heard that I had accepted the chair at Vanderbilt and was going to start a new department there. 
Being from Nashville, Jim asked me to consider him for a faculty position in the new department. I told Jim that I was very flattered by his call and thanked him. In the next breath, I also told him that I had not even interviewed for the position, let alone accepted it. But should that occur, he would be one of the first persons I would call to join the faculty. A few weeks after receiving Jim's call, I did receive a call from the search committee chairman, a general surgeon from Boston, inviting me to visit. As you can imagine, we had no trouble understanding each other and talked quite a bit about the opportunity at Vanderbilt as well as Boston politics, sports, and restaurants. He succeeded in whetting my appetite and I agreed to make a visit. I did request permission to bring my wife so that she could check out Nashville as a possible place to live. <coughs> but I was told that Vanderbilt did not invite wives until the second or third interview. My first visit was very impressive, meeting with the Vice Chancellor, Ike Robinson, and Dean John Chapman, members of the search committee, and the senior practicing otolaryngologist in the community, Dr. Clyde Alley. He would later send me a multiple page, handwritten letter encouraging me to take the job. I also met with Mike Glasscock, who I knew from being on the lecture circuit together. He was most supportive and offered otologic training for our residents. And I did bring my wife with me. I requested to meet with the chief of allergy, which confused the heck out of the dean. Sam Marney gave me a big hug and pleaded with me to come to Vanderbilt and promised loads of sinus disease cases as referrals. I also met with the director of the Bill Wilkerson Center, Fred Bess. After a brief conversation and filling each other out, he and I talked about the future possibility of merging hearing and speech sciences with the Department of Otolaryngology to create a center for otolaryngology and communication disorders. Please remember, nothing happens by accident. I had a second meeting with the Vice Chancellor at the very end of my visit, and I will never forget Ike's parting words to me in his deep and booming voice. Ossoff, I know how much this recruitment will cost me in terms of space, money, and other resources. What I want is for you to go home and think about accepting this opportunity. My reaction to the Vanderbilt job was very positive, and I sat down with Dr. Sisson to discuss the history of the job and the present issues. Prior to getting into those issues, Dr. Sisson told me that having a successful program at Vanderbilt was a high priority among national leaders of otolaryngology head and neck surgery, and he then reminded me that he was still one of those leaders. As he put it, Vanderbilt is too important a program not to have a prominent department in otolaryngology. We then discussed four issues. The first, the full scope of the specialty as defined by the American Board of Otolaryngology and the Residency Review Committee. He told me that I needed to get this in writing and that it meant that otolaryngology at Vanderbilt would be granted privileges in head and neck and cranial based surgery, endocrine surgery of the neck, cranial based surgery, facial plastic and reconstructive surgery, pediatric congenital anomalies, microvascular reconstructive surgery, maxillofacial trauma, and other areas that could evolve in the future as defined by the American Board of Otolaryngology and the Residency Review Committee. This seems absurd perhaps to many of you, but you have to remember back then it was not taken for granted at this institution that otolaryngology would venture into any of these areas. Vanderbilt had a history in surgery and it was not benevolent towards our specialty. The next thing we discussed was space and he advised me that the immediate landing space was important but 
that the permanent space was much more important to make sure that it had capacity for a faculty of six to ten with all the necessary equipment to support all of the subspecialties. Faculty positions we discuss next, and here he told me that we needed a minimum of three otolaryngologists and a basic scientist to get started and approved by the Residency Review Committee, but that I should ask for funded positions for six to eight over a five to seven year period based on clinical and research growth by the department. Finally, we discussed the residency program, and here he advised me that we start with two residency years to create some critical mass, and then we get it started as soon as we can through the RRC. He further advised me to get all of the, applica all of the application materials into the RRC even before I would head to Vanderbilt if possible, and it was. Although I had not yet received an offer, I knew that it would be forthcoming and that I'd better begin to organize a faculty which became known as the Founding Four. In words alone, cannot thank them enough for sharing my dreams and my vision. I began to make phone calls to Jim Duncavage, who was at the Medical College of Wisconsin in Milwaukee at the time. Jim and I had become friends over the past five years, helping each other out on, some, uh, on our respective la uh, laser courses and also working together on some laser-related presentations and publications. I put the bug into Jim to consider making the move with me and becoming vice chairman and program director. I also called back Jim Netterville to let him know that I had made a visit and had an interest in making a move to Vanderbilt pending negotiations and all the other details that went into such a decision. We made plans to meet in Chicago in January when he would be attending the middle section meeting of the Triological Society. And I pretty much offered Jim a position in the virtual new department at Vanderbilt. At home base Northwestern, I began to have discussions with Dave Zeeland to consider making a move to Nashville. Dave was a neuroscience researcher in the Department of Otolaryngology at Northwestern, and I felt that coming to join us at Vanderbilt would be an upward move for him. The job included becoming research and education director with a research technician, as well as the opportunity to have dedicated research block time with our residents. I had shared a lab with Dave during my NIH-funded research here at Northwestern and knew that he had some brilliant ideas and was the first, even back then, to have uh, thought that laryngeal pacing would be the way to solve the immobility problem. I also made calls to Russell Reese to get, to get the scoop about Nashville and Vanderbilt, as well as to get a sense of his level of interest in training our residents in facial plastic and reconstructive surgery. And the good news was that he was interested. Russell, a fellowship trained plastic surgeon, facial plastic surgeon, was in private practice in Nashville and was one of the residents at Northwestern when I was on the faculty there. I made multiple visits to Vanderbilt in the fall and winter of 1985 to 1986. In fact, my visits were so frequent that when I got to know the doorman at Lowe's Vanderbilt Plaza Hotel, he would say, back again? Why don't you just move here? <laughs> During one visit, Susie and Russell Reese took Lynn and I to the Nashville Now TV show hosted by Ralph Emery at Opryland to see Tennessee Ernie Ford of 16 tons fame. After several giant circles around the city on the 265 and other interstate connectors, I said something to Russell to the effect of, all of this looks pretty familiar. The same exits, the same billboards, the same buildings. By any chance, could you be lost? We finally got there and had a great time. And the price was right. It was free. I thought we would go back to the show often, but actually never made it back. On another visit, Vanderbilt arranged for Lynn and me to visit the Grand Ole Opry backstage and meet Roy Acuff and others who were performing there. 
After a while, I said to Lynn that if I am offered and take this job, I will need to start a voice center, whatever that is. Please remember, nothing happens by accident. You have no idea what was involved to bring closure to Vanderbilt's offer and ultimately accept the chair because absolutely nothing was there. Not even an otolaryngology skeleton in the closet. I did receive commitments from other members of the founding four, Drs. Dunkavich, Netterville, and Zela, And from Vanderbilt, it was all about finding space for us to start up and then space in the Vanderbilt Clinic when it would be complete a few years down the road. In designing that space required working with an obnoxious New York architect that drove me crazy because he thought he knew everything. Also, Vanderbilt needed to know what we would need in terms of outpatient office equipment, OR equipment, research equipment, academic office equipment, and so much more. Remember, there was nothing here. Hours were spent meeting with equipment representatives to obtain quotes for things as simple as tonsil snares to as complex as microscopes, video towers, lasers, telescopes, stroboscopes, and on and on. Dr. Dunkavage and I spent the better part of one night in Nashville reviewing list after list, trying to make sure that we had it right. Dave spent much time getting his lists together to set up a research lab, temporal bone lab, machine shop, and other necessary research and educational needs. And Jim Netterville provided us with OR equipment needs and so much more that he was able to get uh, his hands on from the program in Iowa. Meanwhile, letters were being sent back and forth between the dean and me to get it all right. Dr. Sisson had advised me to get everything in writing and that if it was not in writing, it didn't exist. I can remember Vice Chancellor Robinson asking me if I trusted him. And my quick answer was, of course. But then I interjected that if something were to happen to him or the dean, or God forbid both, without such a letter, who knows what the fate of the new Department of Otolaryngology would be. After at least 20 letters, I finally signed what I thought was the comprehensive and correct letter on my 39th birthday, March 25th, 1986. All of us immediately went into move mode, which meant that while we were still holding on to jobs in Chicago and Milwaukee or completing a fellowship in Iowa City, we also had to look into packing up one's house and finding another in Nashville. And some of us had to worry about where our kids would go to school. <coughs> it was amazing how things fell together for all of us. And on my way out of Chicago, I happened to see Jay Warkhaven, who I knew from Chicago Laser Circles, and told him to think of coming to Vanderbilt to get things going in pediatric otolaryngology following the completion of his fellowship. Remember, Nothing happens by accident. Start day was July 1st, 1986, the dawn of a new era of otolaryngology head and neck surgery at Vanderbilt University Medical Center. Our temporary home was the sixth floor of the round wing, one half being academic space and the other side being examination rooms. There was one major problem on July 1st. Dr. Netterville, having done his residency at UT Memphis, was the only one of us to hold a Tennessee medical license. The person in charge of signing license certificates at the state medical license office was on vacation the end of June and into early July. So Dr. Netterville was not only the chief cook and bottle washer, but also the only one of us who could legally and officially examine and possibly operate on a patient. Needless to say, this did get corrected, but for a short time, Jim and I followed our licensed chief into patient rooms and elsewhere. And when there was some free time, Jim tried to teach the two of us how to act Southern, a lost cause. <laughs> there were many minor problems, all of them flexible. 
and fixable. Vanderbilt received all of this clinic and OR equipment and really didn't know what to do with it. So we helped them to sort through it and make trays for our various operative needs in the OR as well as to set up the SMR carts for our clinic examining rooms. We also had to train our OR nurses and staff as well as our clinic staff. In the beginning, Jim Duncavage would do our airway, otologic, sinus, and general otolaryngology cases and soon emerged as the regional expert in both traditional transnasal and endoscopic sinus surgery. He was also the brains behind and one of the co-founders of the Vanderbilt Asthma Sinus Allergy Program. Jim Netterville would do most of the head and neck cases, but occasionally I would join him. I quickly became extremely impressed with Jim's surgical skills. He was one of the most gifted surgeons that I had ever worked with. Early on, I made the decision that Jim would become the preeminent head and neck surgeon in the South as a minimum, and that I would develop a new subspecialty that we now call laryngology. Please remember, nothing happens by accident. We had an assigned administrative assistant who was in charge of our billing for clinic and surgery. Amazingly enough, she did not know it. So after about three months, I was visited by the director of the practice plan wondering what we were doing with all of our time since no billings had been received from us. We quickly found them on our AA's desk, made the necessary personnel changes, and got that correct. <laughs> then we started to see patients and began to do surgery. Fortunately, the otolaryngology community in Nashville was supportive and sent us, sent us lots of tertiary cases that were very appropriate for an academic department to handle. Stirring up good referrals from Vanderbilt, however, was a slightly greater challenge as there had not been a full-time department for some 15 to 17 years, depending upon whom you asked, and this morning we heard it may have even been 18 years. Regardless, we learned to deal with the world's worst cases of cerumen impactions and other non-surgical otolaryngology problems. After multiple thank you notes, phone calls, handshakes, and hanging out at spots in the old cafeteria where some of the internists had lunch, we finally began to break the ice. Our first famous patient was Minnie Pearl, and she was soon followed by Johnny Cash, Larry Gatlin, and so many more. <clears throat> One day, Johnny was late for his visit and was very apologetic. He had, he had got off the elevator on the wrong floor and ended up signing autographs for patients until he was able to escape and get to our clinic. We had our first visiting medical student shortly after our arrival. David Haynes spent a month with us and it was absolutely wonderful to have someone to teach. We shared with David that we were in the process of launching a residency program, hopefully as early as July 1st, 1987. And if we did get approved, would he like to join us as our first resident? Yes, please remember, nothing happens by accident. We had our meeting with the educational site visitor from the Re residency review committee in the conference room on the sixth floor of the round wing shortly following our arrival. We had sent in reams and reams of paperwork sharing our vision of developing one of the best training programs in otolaryngology in the United States prior to our arrival at Vanderbilt. And we had operative numbers from the Otology Group, Nashville General Hospital, VA Hospital, and extrapolated numbers from Vanderbilt University Hospital based on the volumes from general surgery, plastic surgery, and oral surgery that represented the types of cases that we would do. Netterville told the site visitor that we needed residents to teach in the most convincing southern genteel manner. And yes, Galen, today that wouldn't fly as an application. And miracle of miracles, 
we were provisionally approved for two residents a year for two years of surgery and four years of otolaryngology. And we were allowed to backfill five years of slots. David Haynes received the first phone call and became our first resident. Should be part of what should be called the founding five instead of the founding four. We interviewed multiple others for years one through five. Our first third year residents were about to complete two years of surgery at Vanderbilt and were known to us. One will be the subject of a later story. Six years later, we would be approved to expand the residency to three residents a year. I am convinced that the Vanderbilt brand greatly facilitated our initial provisional approval. One of the keys to bringing recognition to Vanderbilt was to offer CME courses at home base. Three emerged quite early in our tenure. The laser course that Jim and I had shared in Milwaukee and Chicago. A laryngeal framework surgery course that I encouraged Jim Netterville to establish and an endoscopic sinus surgery course teaching both conventional and endoscopic sinus surgery that Jim Dunkavich and Jim Stankowitz put together at Loyola and Vanderbilt. Through these courses, we had lots and lots of visitors come through the department and witness firsthand the level of activity and energy that existed at Vanderbilt. Another key to success was to be tastefully opportunistic. By that, I mean that we looked at what everyone else was talking about and presenting at the regional and national meetings, and we found new and novel areas to explore, present, and publish about. This tactic got our feet in the door and on the scientific and instructional programs of many of our otolaryngological societies. It also gave us traction in the American Society for Laser Medicine and Surgery where we would frequently present, publish, and ultimately assume early leadership roles. Yet another key to success was to make Vanderbilt very appealing to resident applicants. One way to do that still takes place. For resident interview weekend, a Friday and Saturday, we closed the clinic and did not allow elective surgery to be scheduled. All faculty and residents when we got them were available to meet with the applicants. We served lunch and began to offer snacks, wine and beer on the evenings prior to interviews. We even hired a van to transport the applicants to and from Vanderbilt. From the very beginning, we had a slideshow highlighting our clinical, research, and educational programs. And we reached out to the early applicants, asking them to share our enthusiasm and vision, and to become part of the next great Department of Otolaryngology. And it worked, as we were able to attract excellent students to train with us as residents. Making certain that we became active on committees and participated in the instructional course program of the Academy, as well as becoming active fellows of the Triological Society and other senior societies represented additional things that the founding four and other early faculty members did to further spread the Vanderbilt otolaryngology brand across the country and world. It may have been our second or third year that we all went to the academy meeting and took one of our residents. Jim, Jim, and I were dining at the hotel restaurant in Washington, D.C. with our restaurant, and while the three of us ordered something reasonable, our resident ordered lobster. I left dinner before everyone else because I had an early committee meeting to attend the next morning. On my way out of the restaurant, I very quietly suggested to the two gyms that when the bill came, have it delivered to the resident. I wish I could have been there to see how white his face turned, according to Jim and Jim, and no, the resident did not pay for the bill, and yes, we still laugh about it whenever we see each other. We like to think of ourselves as a great big family of Vanderbilt otolaryngology, and with that in mind, 
Jim Netterville approached me one day and asked me to speak to one of our residents. It seems that he was the only unmarried resident in the program at the time, and rumor had it that he had a girlfriend on every shift, on every patient floor, in both the north and south towers of Vanderbilt <laughs> University Hospital. And as a result, his studying could be in jeopardy. Well, the math just didn't add up. I mean, he had to have at least 30 romances going on at the same time. So I did approach and present the resident with the facts as I just told them. His response was and remains classic. Dr. Ossoff, if I was 5% as good as the, as the statistics that you just presented me, I would be one very, very happy man. <laughs> the one necessary commodity that we needed and I did not plan well enough for was operating room time. Even if I did plan for it, the problem was that there were not enough operating rooms to support the institution, let alone our department. As a faculty, we grew like weeds. And with that, so did our caseload. Additional faculty were hired as our growth curve dictated, and before long, Vanderbilt Otolaryngology was the model that is now replicated by most programs across the country. Most of the faculty were fellowship trained, academic subspecialists, and those that, that did not do a fellowship became world, world leaders in their respective areas of practice without the fellowship. Key hires during the early years included Mitch Schwab, who came over from the otology group to be our neurootologist in early 1988. Russell Reese, who left practice he was with to become full-time in facial plastic and reconstructive surgery, also in 1988. Jay Workhaven, who joined us following the completion of his two-year pediatric otolaryngology fellowship in 1989. Jack Coleman, who joined us in early 1989 to do general otolaryngology, and Steve Mitchell, who joined us from Austin, Texas to start our office at St. Thomas Hospital around 1990. Ed Stone, a very well-known speech pathologist, vocologist, was recruited from the University of Indiana to help us get started with our voice program in 1987. And Tom Cleveland, a world-renowned vocal professor and former Fulbright Fellowship recipient in voice science, was recruited from the University of Southern California to be our vocal pedagogue in 1991. Another very important recruitment took place in 1990 to 1991 in the person of Brian Berkey from the University of Michigan. Jim Netterville had shared with me the need to recruit our own microvascular reconstructive surgeon and Brian was our person. The recruitment included sending Brian to work with his mentor, Mike Sullivan, for six months of formal fellowship training and then join us on the faculty in January 1992. One small hiccup occurred with these plans. Mike left Michigan and went to the Ohio State University, so Brian had to follow him there for training. Being a diehard Michigan fan, it was a tough move for Brian. But it all ended up well with his joining the department on time and helping us to develop a full scope service in head and neck surgery. The list, excuse me, the first fellowship in the department was offered in head and neck surgery by Dr. Netterville. John Coniglio was our first fellow, July 1990 through June 1991. During that year, John happened to be on call over Labor Day weekend when the annual dove hunts would occur across the state of Tennessee. An ATV accident occurred on a field several miles east of us and fortunately for the patient there were two medically trained nurses from Baptist Hospital, now St. Thomas Midtown, at a dove hunt in the field next door. They witnessed the accident and immediately rushed to the scene and kept the patient alive and breathing. He was life flighted to Vanderbilt and John worked in him to save what parts of the larynx were salvageable. 
The television show Rescue 911 got wind of this, and it aired as an episode with Hollywood John playing himself and the patient ironically driving off on an ATV to end the show. Dave Zila opened his house to the department where we all watched the show on his big screen and enjoyed one of the largest sheet cakes adorned, adorned with a nearly life-size image of John for dessert. During my recruitment, a group of physicists were working on a grant with the Office of Naval Research to try and land Star Wars money from the Strategic Defense Initiative Organization for humanistic research with a free electron laser. I had been involved with a similar project at Northwestern, so as you can imagine, a meeting occurred during one of my recruitment visits which solidified a significant place for otolaryngology within the team that Vanderbilt put together to formally apply for the site visit and contract. And yes, we were approved. We recruited Dr. Lou Reinisch, a very prominent laser physicist, in 1991 to help us lead the research efforts with the free electron laser. The research program allowed faculty and residents in our department access to a truly unique experimental laser, and Galen and Jay worked with it to advance their careers. Lou was a wonderful colleague, and I dubbed him a surgical physicist out of respect for his research creativity and skills performing animal surgery. In 1989-1990, I served as Vanderbilt's representative in a program called Leadership Nashville. Joe Galanti, president of the RCA Music Group, was one of my classmates, and we knew each other because he sent all of his newly signed artists mm. to be seen by us at the department. We sat together on the bus almost monthly, and during that time, I shared with him my vision to open a voice center at Vanderbilt. Joe was extremely helpful with the business plan and committed to get all the other record label executives to send their patients to Vanderbilt as well. I formally presented the plan to Vice Chancellor Robinson, who liked it and asked me to be patient while he found space. So, while I was attending the Southern Section Triological Society meeting in Williamsburg, Virginia, on a Thursday evening in January 1991, I received a phone call from my news and public affairs person, Bill Hance, who said that if I could get Johnny Cash to come in for a picture with me on Saturday, the Voice Center would be featured on the front page of the Tennessean on, Tennessean on Sunday, and Vanderbilt really wanted to do that. He also went on to say that it was likely that President George Herbert Walker Bush would be the feature article announcing the first Gulf War. Johnny's response to my request was absolutely he would be there for the photo shoot. Wow, what an opportunity to have the official notice of the opening of the Vanderbilt Voice Center, share the spotlight with our president making this momentous announcement. Hopefully all of you have seen this historic framed article hanging in the Voice Center. After deliberations with the faculty, I, start, I decided to start a fellowship in laryngology in care of the professional voice sometime in 1991 with the plan to fill it for the 1992 1993 academic year. Mark Corey shared my vision that laryngology was going to be the next subspecialty in otolaryngology head and neck surgery and committed to join me for the year and become our first fellow. Mark stayed on the faculty following the completion of his fellowship and spent time between the Voice Center and St. Thomas Hospital where we had opened an office. Laryngology had a 12-month in a six-month fellow for the first two years, and then expanded to have two fellows yearly after that. And Vanderbilt is credited with being the birthplace of the subspecialty of laryngology through the establishment of the advanced training program in laryngology and the opening of the multidisciplinary Vanderbilt Voice Center. Dr. Garrett was one of the fellows during year three, 
and she stayed on the faculty after her fellowship to share time at the Voice Center in St. Thomas as well as becoming very involved in the free electron laser program. I am certain she does not forget that she also took over our otology program for about a year following Mitch Schwaber's departure to private practice and prior to our being able to bring David Haynes back from private practice in Mobile, Alabama to become our division chief in neurootology. I believe that was 1980, excuse me, 1996. Many of you may remember former Vice President Gore claiming credit for developing the internet and global warming. Not to be outdone, Jim Netivo and I take credit for the concept of instant messaging. He would be in the OR <laughs> operating late, and I mean very late. And some problem with OR scheduling, equipment or staffing would arise, and he would send me these late night emails sharing his frustrations. I was up working on departmental related business and would see his emails and respond immediately. He noticed, and hence our claim to fame. Just kidding. <laughs> Departments become great when their leadership is committed to pushing the faculty and residents to become the very best they can be and then some. In other words, my job was to provide resources and point everyone in the right direction, and I took that responsibility very, very seriously. In closing, I want to thank all of you for the privilege and opportunity to be part of this great department, now Center. Vanderbilt presented me with the academic opportunity of a lifetime. The department rose from nothing to become a world leader in so many ways over 32 years. And now, we are experiencing our second generation of national leaders emerge directly from Vanderbilt or indirectly through those that we have trained and have moved on to other programs. Thank you, Ron, for allowing me to share my memories of the very beginning of this great department. Well, Thanks so much. We started off with you presenting awards. So this is actually a presentation for you. So and it says, Vanderbilt University Medical Center, the Department of Otolaryngology names Robert H. Ossoff, DMD, MD, founding chair of the Department of Otolaryngology, Vanderbilt University Medical Center, as the inaugural Robert H. Ossoff, DMD, MD, annual lecturer, November 2nd, 2018. We sincerely appreciate your exceptional contributions to the department during your tenure in the Department of Otolaryngology. So you just gave, you didn't know it, I did the first <laughs> Ossoff lecture, which will be continued in perpetuity. That is awesome. Thank you. Thank you.